What it do? This is the War Room with P Mac. P Mac, that's P Mac. I am you. That's the letter, not the word. And today we are here, and we're gonna look at draft strategies. This show is about draft strategies and uh, off-season strategies to see more, not just about a three P, but how to move forward in the most, in the best way we know how. Especially over there, the mastermind himself, P Mac. What's going on, man? What is going on, this? Thank you guys for jumping on here today on another episode of The War Room with PMAC presented by Chiefs Focus. It's been a wild year in terms of the free agency period and the draft preparation, as it is in every other area. Thiz and I will provide you guys with uh, the viewers' front office insight into the offseason needs for the Chiefs uh, after the first uh, period of free agency, identify how putting the right pieces together will lead to success this upcoming season, hopefully becoming the first team ever to three-peat. So let's go on with our first segment, This First of all, I got to say this. We, we, the idea of a three-peat is born just more than just the noble, the noble thought. The idea of a three-peat has never happened. It has never happened in the NFL. Never happened. And so for those, I, most of you all know, but some of you all don't know, this has never happened in the NFL. It's happened in baseball, never. happened in basketball. It's happened in, I want to say even hockey. I'm not a super hockey fan, but, you know, Maybe. it's happening in the big, it's happening in the big, the big sports, except for football. And that's what makes that's what makes the NFL so the way it is is because they have built into their mainframe uh, they have built they have built the the randomness that, that's the word I'm going to use because I can't think of another one right now they have built their randomness into their system. That's the whole point of the draft. That's the whole point of, of, of the draft order being the way it is. The loser gets to go first, you know, and the winners get to go last, get to pick last because they built that into their mainframe to make sure that everybody gets a chance in an effort to build a better product. Um, instead of doing the lottery draft, instead of doing all that, um, they, they just decided the loser gets to go first. Now, of course, that right. makes some tanking a little bit, but you know that doesn't mean you're actually going to win a Super Bowl. It, it, it's right. just it's so difficult to win a Super Bowl. We can't say it's easy. Uh, so, like I said, the NFL has built uh, built that competition into their mainframe, and it is it to me it works. That's one of the reasons why uh, no one has ever been able to three P. So, um. Shoot. Since we ain't got nothing else right now, f- let's get into it. We have had some re-signings recently, and uh, mm-hmm. we're here to talk about them. So the show, the name of the show is "What's the Next Move?" Yeah, what is the next move? Definitely. And uh, before we get to the re-signings, we're going to start off with a big new signing that Chiefs fans have been covening for almost the beginning of this um, offseason period, and that is a wide receiver opposite Rasheed Rice and somebody who can open up for not only Rasheed Rice, but uh, Big Yeti, Travis Kelsey. And they have done that this past uh, weekend by adding a new weapon for Patrick Mahomes, and that is none other than former Ravens and Cardinals wide receiver Marquise Hollywood Brown as he lands in a perfect spot with the Chiefs on a one-year deal worth up to $11 million with a chance to cash in next year. During his final year in Baltimore in 2021, Brown had 91 catches, over 1,008 yards, and six touchdowns. During 26 games over two seasons with Arizona, Brown had, you know, 118 catches for 1,283 yards and seven touchdowns. You could look at him as somebody to replace MVS as the main deep threat for the Chiefs. And when you compare them in catches, uh, Hollywood Brown has only a 4% drop rate. MVS had 7% drop rate. Kadarius Toney, 
13% drop rate. So this is a big move for Kansas City, somebody who's a better pass catcher, uh, effective deep threat guy. And also, if you uh, hear about what was said about him coming into the 2019 draft class compared to him and McCall Harmon, yes, McCall was the better deep threat, but Marquise is the superior route runner compared to um, McCall Harmon. And Matching Brown, who wins with his 4.33 speed in the short and deep areas with Patrick Mahomes, who keeps opposing defenses, especially safeties, nervous and wins with passes in the short and intermediate areas areas of the field is a win. And Brown is a legit deep threat who opens up the field the same way Deshaun Jackson did in Philly and also Tyreek used to do for Andy Reid's schemes when he was in KC. And Brown will be able to be a capable uh, complement to Rasheed Rice. Make no mistake, Rice is the number one wide receiver in KC, but Brown will help spread the res- the defense's attention on one side while Brown stretches one side. You know, tight ends, Travis Kelsey and Noah Gray are going to give linebackers fits in the middle of the field. So that's a big thing for us. And in other news, Going to our re-signings, the Chiefs retained some of their key pieces in the interior defensive line unit by re-signing Derek Nottie, big Mike Pinnell, a.k.a. Godzilla, because <laughs> he terrorized Trent Williams and uh, Christian McCaffrey that game. He was one that forced that fumble on Christian McCaffrey to be uh, on the Niners' first drive, and also uh, Tershawn Wharton to one-year deals. Derek Nottie, who is 27, started all 17 games each in the past two seasons, in 2023, he played almost 500 snaps, 498 snaps, got 29 tackles, a sack, and a pass deflection. Pinnell, who joined the practice squad in uh, late October, got three uh, appearances during the regular season before playing in all four of the Chiefs' uh, postseason games, getting over 40 snaps in both the divisional round and Super Bowl 58, and earned the second best defensive pro football focus grade of any player in the game. And the Chiefs hope to see Pinnell add to those totals as with his second tour of duty with the team as it continues in 2024. And then you go to uh, Wharton, and I got to say, first episode, he was one of those guys I said, test them, let him test the market. And um, I was hoping that they wouldn't bring him back. It's nothing against Wharton. It's just that um, – I just didn't see the same explosion, but from what we hear that he's had a better season in 2023, almost looking like his old self from 2020 when he was brought in as an undrafted free agent. And uh, he had two sacks and, you know, five quarterback hits in all 17 games, and he contributed in a a reverse role. But he started one game and has been a, a consistent part of the Chiefs' defensive nucleus since he signed in 2020. It was a wise move to bring him back. Um, who's a solid member of that defensive line, who's been with Chris Jones and also helping out uh, Carl Loftus and also ushering in uh, Amonahue and uh, Felix and DK Uzama. And once again, you got to remember, Warden has bounced back, especially this year after suffering an ACL tear in 2022 because mm-hmm. we were beginning 2022. He was looking like his old self, but um, – I was starting to see him trying to get the rust off, and maybe that was what my criticism was, was not seeing that he was getting the rust off. But it makes sense why they bring him back. And uh, he either plays alongside Chris Jones or in relief in of Chris Jones, depending on whatever happens to one of him or uh, Pinnell or Naughty. But is he's very essential to um, Spag's game plan. So That's what I was going to make sure I, I tell you that there was, there's always rust, and then after you get rid of the rust, you got to worry about, uh, you got to think about. I'm sure the thought process is not re-injury, because he wants to, you know, he wants to be a part of the game plan. So, I, I, I like Turk. I didn't think we'd be able to get him back, because the league is looking for passers and pass rushers. So, you know, three technique uh, guys his size too, and there's a lot of them in his upcoming draft class too. I thought the Saints might take him instead of uh taking Willie Gay, but um Yeah. But because they're always getting pass rushers from us if we're gonna be real about it. Between um Tano Pass and Yo, um 
What's the kid? That, what's the dude that can do backflips? Ah, uh, what's his name? Colin Saunders. Colin Saunders, like all those guys, like they love Chiefs defenders. Oh they man, the New Orleans Chiefs. Chiefs defenders. Yeah, they so. got Tyron Matthew, Tano, uh, Colin, uh, they got, Colin uh, and now they got Willie. Oh man, don't forget that they ended up having uh, the safety that used to be play line. Dirty up, Dan. Dirty Dan Sorensen. So. Don't forget that. They loved your former cheeks. So we keep yeah. it moving. We keep it moving. So um, the thing about but I, but before we move on on that part about those guys, but to speak on all three of the D linemen, I think that when you see that, some people were saying in the comments on Twitter that some thought that these moves meant that the Chiefs don't like this defense of line class of interior in this draft class, but that's far from the case. Uh, Nadi Pinnell, Wharton returns to the defensive line room for the 2024 NFL season, but each are on one-year deals each. So the Chiefs are going to be looking to add another interior defensive lineman in terms of depth and for the future to develop with Chris Jones and George Carl Loftus. And they could still address this by using one of their top 100 picks on a defensive tackle who has the tools to uh, two gap and control the inside of the defensive front because we need capable uh, death piece able to step in for either starter in the event of a minor in- injury. So they have Wharton Pinnell as quality rotational pieces, but they could use another who could step in for Chris Jones in third and long situations and penetrate, which would be another weapon for Spag scheme. So here's the thought process behind that. Uh, with the best way I can here's the best way I can explain it the idea the idea is to have as much depth as possible and I don't give the Eagles I give the Eagles a lot of credit but yeah. I, I'm going to be honest with you the thought process that I've had for this team has been to get yourself enough linemen now they they go overboard uh how he how he goes overboard and how he's their gm is that's what i'm referring to him i've always referred to him as that but he's gone overboard where they got like 10 linemen on the thing so they just rotate them in and out in and out in and out by the by fletcher cox has retired um but uh they just keep their linemen fresh that's their idea and and I've always wanted to have a, a defensive line to where you get guys in there because you get keep guys fresh because it's not like yeah the line, exactly the, the defensive line is not like the running back system like running backs I don't know how you sub them in so often like running backs need needs full steam like they need to uh, get accustomed to the game in order to start um, breaking off big runs. Defensive linemen, not so much. You can keep them fresh, keep the guys ready to run, keep the guys ready to go, and uh, get them in there uh, in situational uh, in situational downs. So I think the Chiefs are close to doing that. I don't think they're doing it in the manner that I'm thinking, but they are trying to make sure that they keep enough defensive linemen in the same manner that they keep offensive linemen. Absolutely. Um, Because that's their situation on offensive linemen, too. So, yeah. So, as we move forward, man, as we continue to move forward. uh, So, we talked – we just got done talking about the the, uh, signings and re-signings. Now, now let's talk about um, some some concepts. Some concepts. What's going on? Offensive concepts. We we have we have a good amount of receivers now. Um, I think we probably we probably need one more at least. Um, but as it stands currently, what is your thought process on that? All right, and that leads me into segment two, and it's the Chiefs' wide receiver alignment. And I'm going to explain to the fans here of what this process is. And it's my process of finding the type of wide receiver the Chiefs are going to look for now after the Brown signing. And this inspiration comes from Pro Football Focus. And in 2018, they made up an article series 
uh, on the NFL prototypes on each specific position, like defensive backs, defensive linemen, uh, wide receivers. Their formula was used. And I like their formula because it was able an eye opener for me because I'm a visual learner, you know, having autism. um, You see images and you see things clearly in plain sight where they show you the type of receivers or the different types of players. Let's say like defensive backs, press man corner, off man zone corner, the slot corner, single high safety, box safety, the dime linebacker safety, like, you know, the Jamal Adam or the uh, Cam Chancellors, which I hope the Chiefs look for in this draft, that type of safety. But uh, specifically, we're talking about wide receiver. So I decided to use this as a tool to look at what we're looking for. And you got the five different types of categories. That is your shifty slot, your big slot, your deep threat, possession receiver, and routes runner. And out of these five different broad strokes strokes which of these five do the Chiefs really need so going to this segment we're going to break down which player on the team we got now holds these certain categories and which one is the open one that we don't have and I'm going to explain why and we're going to start with number one our shifty slot slot receiver and I'm banking on Kadarius Tony as being one of them and I know fans are sick of KT and his antics but this goes mm-hmm. along with and it's just hear me out what I'm about to say here and this is what I've said originally as him being as my breakout star as in one of my last episodes it's a contract season and rest in peace to the late and great uh Therese Paler like he always says the contract year stays undefeated. Absolutely. And remember, yes, and remember, in college, Tony was used like a traditional slot receiver, getting a steady diet of targets over the middle of the field. Florida also used Tony's marionette doll movement patterns to have him make game-breaking cuts all across the field, which put defenders in conflict on almost every snap. If the Chiefs simply watch the film from his 2020 season at Florida and utilize him the same way, you can thank me later. But you just got to put him in the right position, not just use him all the time. You just got to put him in the right mismatches just to get that. And in 2020, Tony provided Kyle Trask, who is now with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, with a legitimate number one receiver, posting a career-high 70 catches for 984 yards. He was 16 yards away from being a 1,000-yard receiver at Florida that year. And 55 of those receptions and nine of his 10 touchdowns came from the slot that year. This suggests that whenever he whenever he does and he's up, he'll need to accept an extended role working from the slot, particularly a against zone looks his career trajectory from here could be something similar to former Seahawks wide receiver Doug Baldwin and if if he wants it a lot of his successes in 2020 from the tape as I watched came from the slant routes working the middle of the field against zone coverage it's easy and correct to say we all know Tony drops so many passes we know that and it didn't make and, and he didn't make enough explosive plays like he did when he first came to the team in 2020 with the ball in his hand to justify the wide receiver one hype. But he's shown us that he has the speed, elusiveness, and the yak ability to pr- pr- to produce from the slot, excuse me. Doug Baldwin, speaking of him, was known as the shifty slot king for years. And when you look at KT's measurables compared to Doug Baldwin, KT runs a 4-3-9. He has oh, nine reps on 225 bench press. Doug Baldwin, 44840, six reps on 225 bench press, showing that KT is faster and he's stronger and he could do what Baldwin did, especially if you get him in underneath routes and he will be deadly. So in other words, 2024 is going to be a make it or break it year for Tony and his success will lie within the slot if the Chiefs give him that opportunity. I'm with you on all of those things. I just worry about him being that healthy specimen that we need him to be. He was only healthy all year last year because he wasn't used very often towards the end of it. Uh, So 
um, these alignments, that alignment you won't have all season. And unless yeah. unless you find a guy, now, now hear, hear me out. The Chiefs, Andy Reid specifically, tends mm-hmm. to like those shifty slot guys, right? And mm-hmm. that was one of the whole reasons the Anthony Thomas was on the team. He wasn't shifty, yes. but he was at least fast, and he was able to use angles to his advantage, right? Absolutely. So, so that's the concept here that we're looking at. Um, so I don't, I definitely don't disagree with you. I actually like that. Um, even, even with his limited use, we want to make sure that, that they, that we uh, minimize him staying on the injury report. So you probably won't yeah. use it every game, but it is, it is definitely something that you can look forward to. Um, let's move on to our next one, the big slot. And the big slot goes to the one and only big Yeti. Travis Kelsey and when you line him up Kelsey dominates the slot is no exception and listen to this this 50% of his routes this past year came lined up in the slot basically he's more than a tight end he's more of a slot wide receiver 6'5 250 plus pounds and he averaged according to Pro Football Focus, 1.89 yards per route, which is almost two yards per route, which would still make him a beast. And it was fifth best in the NFL among all the tight ends in the NFL. Only TJ Hawkinson, Taysom Hill, who went from quarterback to now being a full-time tight end, Sam Laporta, and George Kettle were better. You'd have to go back to 2014 to find a season in which Kelsey didn't accomplish this this feat that sort of consistency is why he's the prototype for the position especially in Andy Reid's scheme just like Rob Gronkowski was for the Patriots because Kelsey was known as the big slot king as well but I mean Gronk was but now Kelsey has taken over and here's the thing about big uh, here's the thing about big Yeti uh Travis Kelsey it's time to start thinking about extending his career and making sure, because he wants to play as long as he can. He's already stated he's going to play until the wheels fall off, right? Right. Which which denounces the part that I thought he was going to try to retire with his brother and, you know, go into the Hall of Fame together possibly. That's what I thought. But he said he's going to roll with it until the wheels fall off. And you never know when your idea, your your thought process changes. You never know when that's going to change. But as of right now, he's probably going to play out the rest of his contract, right? So with that being said, in an effort to make sure he stays healthy for the playoffs, in an effort to make sure he stays healthy for the long run in order to keep him for not just this year, but next season, you got to make sure that you keep him in, keep him out of harm's way. And one of the ways for, to do that is to keep him in that big slot role, obviously, instead of uh, making him some sort of hybrid and throwing him out there and doing certain things with him that I, I like put him at the quarterback position and the running back position, all that kind of stuff. Like you got to minimize those situations, but I definitely see what you're referring to as far as the big slot for Travis Kelsey. Let's move on to our deep threat. All right. And that goes to the guy that we just got recently, none other than uh, Marquise Brown. This is the thing about deep threats. Um, Deep threats have the ability to alter coverages in a way others can't. You can't have a slow cornerback playing man coverage against Mm -hmm. Hollywood Brown without a safety help over the top period. Similarly, there are a lot of receivers with speed, but they're, but, It is known how, but it's it's knowing how to use that speed that makes Brown so dangerous. And that's what others talk about him in a way. And also just like with Tyree Kill, it's the way you use your speed, especially with your game. And he hits his stride length and pace and catches defenders off guard. He attacks their leverage to set up cuts and lurks in blind spots when they make zone drops he gets wildly open on his cuts and his speed and quickness are 
dangerous weapons after the catch too. Brown doesn't have the size. He's 5'9", 165, but he's so quick. DBs have trouble laying hands on him at the line of scrimmage. And like I said uh, originally when I first brought talk about it in our first segment, he – was not the best deep threat coming out of 2019 draft class. It was McCall Hardman. But between him and Hardman, Brown is the more superior route runner than Hardman. And his game-changing speed and his quickness combined with uh, his route running, with Mahomes throwing him the ball, could give him his first Pro Bowl selection, maybe not almost close to Sammy Watkins, especially uh, what Sammy did on the outside and his explosiveness, he doesn't he doesn't just have blending four point three three speed. He knows how to use it, and that's the what I like cons- about Brown being our deep threat. The concept of him having this speed and being able to use it is one of those things that. Andy Reid has always been not just familiar with, but always utilizes in his receivers. If you look back when you uh, when you talk about his Eagles days, Deshaun Jackson, um, he was able to get he's able to get them in an open field to where that speed could be utilized, where he could create a decent enough gap between your linebackers and your cornerbacks, or your linebackers and your safeties in an effort to get you in the open field to make a football move and then take off. Use that speed to your advantage. We saw, we've seen him draw it up with uh, players like McCole. We've seen him even draw yeah. it up, obviously, for Tyreek. Uh, we've seen him draw it up for a few different receivers. So, uh, obviously, we know that Andy Reid can do that, and that is what Hollywood was brought here for. Now, please, please don't use this and say that uh, Hollywood is going to be Tyreek number two. It's not happening. There's no, no, no there's no more no. Tyreek two. Like I, I've I've seen that narrative out there. Uh, yeah. I'm not going to call any names, but that's not happening. Hollywood yeah. is not Tyreek. Hollywood is not even yeah. close to Tyreek. But Hollywood gets can get the job done specifically what Andy Reid wants him to do. So yes, sir. as we as we move on, uh who's our next guy that we're discussing? And all right, and this goes to the position, the possession receiver, or you can call it the X or the possession. This is the guy who gets the volume of catches. Possession receivers are known for their ability to turn a heavy target share into consistently moving the chains, knowing the examples flies that example better than two guys, DeAndre Hopkins and Devontae Adams. Uh, when you look at that type of chain mover for the Chiefs, you got to look none other than second year man from SMU, Rashi Rice, who I compared to Devontae Adams. That was my pro comparison of him coming out. And last season, he exemplified the possession mode when he only had one of his 105 catches in total with the postseason and um, the regular season combined um, were at least thrown 20 yards deep downfield. And you could say that's not good or, you know, because he should have more deep threat catches like deep catches, but you got to look at the fact that what he did between zero to nine, 10 to 19 yards, in those yards after the catch, he still shows that he is a capable deep threat, which he showed at mm-hmm. SMU, but it's indicative of his ability in the short and intermediate range that where he almost got a thousand yards in his rookie season. We got to remember Rasheed Rice was 62 yards away from being the chief's first ever rookie receiver to get over a thousand yards, you know, mm-hmm. and Rice will get, even better now with Brown speed and teams will have to still keep their eye on rice when he gets open in spaces against zone without being double. Also, we got to look at he's in year two. He's in year two. Yes. So there, there comes a knowledge when you actually play the NFL game. Uh, every level, it's levels to this thing. Um, when you go from middle school to high school, there's different levels of that. You go from high school to college, different levels of that. And then college to the pros. Uh, when I started realizing Rashi is actually getting understanding and uh, 
applying his skill set to the game of football, uh, to the NFL level, is when he broke off that one um, that one run along the uh, the sideline because that wasn't his route. That was not his route. He just right. saw an opening and he took it. And who hit him? Patrick Mahomes just hit him, and he almost ran for a touchdown. Had he had a little bit more speed, he would have ran for a touchdown. I think he was short, like three yards. I can't remember who it was against. But he broke that route. He broke that route off, and he saw an opening, and he's like, you know what? I'm just going to take this. And Patrick Mahomes saw him because, you know, no matter what the game plan is, Pat loves the long ball. So he's yeah. always going to find you downfield. And Rashi saw it and he took it. So that's where I'm coming from. He is learning very well, very quickly for a guy who I didn't, I thought it was going to take him at least two years to learn. But hey, you know, Rashi, Rashi is learning. So uh, yeah. we got we got our shifty slot in uh, Kadarius Tony. We got our big slot in Big Yeti. We got our deep threat in Hollywood Brown, and then we got our possession uh, receiver with Rashi. Now, and now, one, now you got Brown and Rice, so Brown Rice together. So this is the thing, though. Um, that leads me to that one, as you were going to say, and I'm sorry if I cut you off on that. But, you're good. Uh, but anyway, that leaves us with one position we need: a route runner, a pure route runner and i know fans are going to ask what is a pure route runner that you're talking about um in this case i could have gone with justin watson but he's been inconsistent in my book once he saw the field yes recently once he saw the field there were plenty of highlight plays and negative plays to support either side of the argument of his for his sake watson does have impressive quickness with the route running ability, that's the ability within your footwork to create separation, to set up deep shots down the sideline and on post plays. But he also had four drops that appear to be a result of a lack of focus. So his hands still need to improve, but his overall contributions were much greater this past season than they've been the first five years of his career. But that leads me to say, what? so what are you saying? Yes, get a Justin Watson type a body player, but imagine having Justin Watson with the playing with the playing ability of Antonio Brown. So that's what I'm talking about. He is the complete outlier. And before you show the clip here, this this is the type of guy we're talking about here. Antonio Brown, yes, he was listed at 5'10, 181 pounds. But you gotta remember from 2013 to 2017. When he was with the Steelers, he averaged about 116 catches, 1,500, almost 1,600 yards receiving, and 10 touchdowns per year. Those those numbers would be a career year for any elite receiver in the NFL. And like you're going to see here on this play against the Tennessee Titans in 2017, Antonio Brown was renowned for his route running and the ability to gain separation against bigger and faster defensive backs. And unlike this play here, Brown shows how much he's a true technician, putting on a full display of skill sets just like this right here. Look at that. The footwork to gain separation and to uh, locate the ball. And look, old friend alert, Juju Smith-Schuster, number 19 at the time there. See like, see him at inside right slot going against, um, I don't know who that guy is, but look at his footwork. Just to fight it off hand eye coordination to locate the ball, make that contested catch. We don't we know it's a helmet catch, but that was such one of the best catches I've seen from A B. And route running in the NFL takes a considerable degree of dedication and nuance. NFL defenders mm-hmm. are able to watch every snap and every target for a specific player for their entire career. If a receiver doesn't vary his release and route stems, he will get beat by smart defense backs. Brown was a consummate professional in this regard, and he ran the same route in multiple ways each game, never allowing the opposition to get a handle on his style, just like you saw in that play there. That's the type of player that we need. Doesn't matter the size as long as he makes the contested catches, and he's a dog. The ability to get open as well as finish plays is what they need to look for in this uh, draft class of receiver talent. So, oh, with that you know, being said, 
Give me right. give me some examples of what you're looking for. Okay. And, you're looking okay. So I'm gonna just throw some names out there, but before you show the guys that we're talking about, you got guys like Arizona's Jacob Counting and Georgia's Lat Con Conkey who are great examples of that type of A B size player. But the Chiefs are gonna look for somebody who has the same playing ability. But with Justin Watson's size, you know, Justin Watson's 6'3", 200 pounds, you've got to at least be six feet, six one, and be at least 200 pounds. And we all know Marvin Harrison Jr. is the unanimous best wide receiver and best route runner in this draft class. But he won't even be there for the Chiefs to get. He's a top three, top five pick. Yeah. So that's why I like guys like South Carolina's Xavier Leggett. And we all know Xavier Leggett has been getting a lot of uh, – views on social media especially for his uh southern accent but who cares man just like tip rodman from illinois who say he doesn't believe in birds i don't care if this guy has a funny accent just like when people made fun of pat when he first came onto the scene with his voice like travis kelsey and tyreek said that they made fun of his voice when he first opened his mouth this guy can ball Leggett was another combine standout as he showcased his speed on the field through the 2023 suits, and including one of the plays you're going to show here, that blistering 76-yard touchdown against Mississippi State in South Carolina's fourth game of the year, where he came away with a reception of 30 yards or more. Ooh, look at him, man. In eight games last season, smart, savvy player who knows the ins and outs of the game like the back of his hand, a physical player before and after the catch, just like you saw there. Top shelf size at 220-plus pounds, 439 speed, elite-level ball skills in hands, breaks tackles, makes defenders miss routinely, runs away from defenders in space. Andrew Reed loves to get creative with these type of players, and Leggett would have a chance to really shine as the third option in this offense and you know they love to move Tyreek Hill around the formation like McCall Harmon and Kadarius Tony in the horizontal passing game I would imagine they could use Leggett in the same fashion having Brown take the top off of the defense leaving Kelsey Rice and Leggett to feast underneath it would be a fun thought for Chiefs fans and would be very terrifying for the rest of the league so if it's not Leggett how about the best hands receiver in his draft class. And we're going to, and we're talking about best hands. We're talking about somebody who rarely drops passes thrown his way. And we'll go to the University of Washington and we can talk about Rome Odunze. And Rome Odunze is one of those guys that everybody loves and everything like that. But I'm talking about his teammate, um, Jalen Pollock. He is known as the best hands wide receiver, according to Pro Football Focus. Pollock may not have the best catch percentages, but he posted solid numbers. And the way he makes it look when he brings in passes makes it more impressive. Over the last two seasons with Washington, he secured over 90% of his catchable passes and contest and has a 53% contested catch percentage, which is one of the top 15 best among the uh top prospects in this draft class even better some better than marvin harrison jr and uh even malik neighbors which is crazy and he has acrobatic ability and strength to bring in um uh, the football which is what stands out to me on tape he has nine point uh seventy five percent which is basically almost close to 10 inch hands which maximizes his entire catch radius pollock isn't a burner but makes himself into an unconventional deep threat with the ability to haul in those contested catches and wins 50-50 balls with physicality at the catch point, leaping, great leaping ability, amazing body control that you will see on film and great, great hands. And when you see this man, he's like a cross between Adam Thielen and George Pickens. He has the talent to be a true outside receiver. Like you see that, man, them acrobatic catches, just like we saw Antonio Brown on that play against the Titans, makes those great plays. He has the talent uh, where Mahomes has never really had consistently before since Sammy Watkins. He could probably be better than Sammy. This offense is, was at its best when Sammy was on the outside. And uh, Polk has – yeah. Did I say Pollock? I mean, Polk. Jalen Polk. Was, yes, yes, Jalen Okay, Jalen Polk. Jalen Polk. Polk. Excuse me, people. Jalen, excuse me if I got it wrong. Jalen Polk. Polk has the talent to be that type of guy for Kansas City on the outside. And, well, for me, if I had to pick 
either of those guys, it would be legged if you can yeah, get absolutely. him. Absolutely. I think he's the best. He could do everything. Absolutely. He can give you the big playability, but also he could do a lot of dirt work on third down and in the red zone. And he would give Mahomes a lot of free yards after the catch. And that would be my choice. But when you look at the four guys, Leggett, Polk, uh, McConkey, and uh, Counting, Mahomes would make a start out of any of these four guys. But I would go with Leggett. With Leggett, Leggett has a frame, he's durable. He uh he's fast, he's durable. Uh I see a guy that will work so well in this system when I look yeah. at Leggy. Polk, you actually put me on the Polk. I did not know about Polk before. Jalen Polk, not Pollock. Jalen Polk. Yeah. Get that yeah right. I was yes. gonna, we were gonna, I was gonna talk to you about it. But hey, um I definitely got put on the Jalen Polk and he he's he's definitely got some skills that can be used. Uh, so with that being said, now we, um, we've, we've discussed who could be that route runner, uh, in the chiefs wide receiver alignment prototype. And we discussed Mm -hmm. about Xavier Leggett or Jalen Polk. Yes. So as we close this segment out, we have one more segment, and that, of course, is our mock draft. But as we move forward, I do think it would, would it would behoove us to probably look deeper into some more players. One of these days, we'll look into maybe maybe we'll highlight it next next episode. Uh, who will be who? Who other? What other receivers could play? that route running uh, role in the wide receiver pro type. Cause I'm be honest with you. It, it, this gave me a little bit of uh made me want to go look it up a little bit more. Cause I definitely didn't know about Jalen Polk. So um, yeah. with that being said, we still, we, with time behooving us, we need to move on as we move on to P max mock draft 5.0. So All right. with our, with our mock draft, we got our first pick at number 32. All right. And once again, I did the pro football focus mock draft simulator. I like to be graded on the picks I made. And uh, excuse me, I just had a text from my fam. Uh, Ignore that for a little bit there. Uh, One of the three best interior defense alignment in that mock draft dropped because of the rise of other prospects like guys like Byron Murphy or his teammate uh, Tavondre Sweat from Texas and teams need and And based off of team needs, this player would be a best player available pick for the Chiefs. Better defensive line play makes uh, pass rushers Chris Jones and George Karloff this more dangerous. Nice moves re-signing Derek Nottie, Mike Pinnell, and Tershawn Wharton. But those players could be gone in a year. So despite dropping significantly in this mock draft, Brett Veach still gets a premium player, and that is Illinois' All-American Jerzon Johnny Newton, who has the goods to anchor this group alongside Jones and Furious George for a long time. Newton has provided serious rotational value at multiple spots. He is able to rush from a zero technique, one technique, three tech, and has the speed to get up field. He's an explosive athlete with cl- and closes quickly upfield, as you see here. Man, look at him going in, closing in on the quarterback with that speed and that lateral quickness. Um, he, and uh, he would be a nightmare on twists and stunts with Jones. But because of his size, 6'3", uh, 304 pounds, he will struggle against double teams and he'll probably get knocked back a few. But he resembles Justin Medubuke, who I wanted the uh, Chiefs to get if Jones wasn't going to come back. But that's what I see in uh, he, he would be a drop. But I don't see him dropping that far. Lock getting the start for Tanner Mordecai. Oh, my goodness! Just crushed by Newton! And a flag comes down! I'm telling man. you, man. I, I, I see plays from him, and I've, I've seen Newton in a few games. I don't watch a lot of college football, but um, I've seen him. He's he's flashed off the screen, and he definitely screams first-round talent, right? Um, one thing I did like about him is they moved him. You, as you mentioned, they moved him. He's one technique, two technique. He he can do it, yeah. you know. 
uh, you can move him, even though his frame is bigger, he can rush from the outside. He can rush from the inside. And I do believe, I do believe that whatever defensive tackle that they get with um, FAU, Felix and UDK Uzama, with him being one of the guys that's going to um, come into this game this year, who's going to be more of a more of a guy that you'll see more often in this rotation. Having a guy like this will take pressure off of Chris Jones. You know that that if he comes in and he learns quickly, he will take uh, he will take he won't take snaps from because Chris Jones is one of those, no he won't take snaps from. But having him in there will get you. You can get uh, the four, the the three four movement. I mean, you get the three four uh, defensive sets, or you can get the four three defensive sets. You can even go four four with the guys we have at linebacker. Like there are uh, a great amount of options that you could do with a Jazan Newton if you have if you draft him, and it also gives Spags another pass rusher. In. Spags. Spags with weapons. That's the last thing that the league needs. Um, yeah. Let's go to number two, which I'm, right. which I'm surprised at this pick because I thought I might, he might not be a first round talent, but with the press that he's getting over the last couple of weeks, he might be a first round talent. Let's go. All right. And this guy was another steal for me at number 64, and he's available because of the other wide receiver talent Mm -hmm. that would probably be selected before him. While the Chiefs have a loaded group of talented receivers, even adding Brown, the the Chiefs still appears to have a bunch of number two receivers. So a plan needs to bring in place a young, savvy receiver that can win versus press coverage and separate on slants and quick game routes. And South Carolina's Xavier Leggett, who's a freak athlete at 6'3", 220, probably 227, who's fast, explosive, precise, and productive, would fix that. He can run through arm tackles, put moves on defenders in open field, and head off to the races with his 4'39 speed at 220-plus pounds. Slant routes are especially terrifying. He catches in stride at full speed, burst past the cornerback covering him with just middle of the field safety and backside pursuit to beat. Defensive coordinators playing the Chiefs will get nightmares just thinking about it. He would become a great weapon with size in the passing game with his speed on deep routes and his yards after the catch ability in the short passing game. He could very easily be wide receiver three on the Chiefs depth chart come week one, which should see him get some playing time early on in the season. I can't say enough about Xavier Leggett. I I really like his tape, his film, his the he's speed sure. that he possesses at his size is really amazing. He's got he doesn't have a slender frame, so he definitely has a a, a, a bulkier frame, which theoretically will help him with if if it will help him minimize the injuries theoretically now. Um, but seeing him separate in coverage, like, I mean, seeing him separate those split the defenders and get downfield on this play was at his size was amazing. Normally you see smaller shiftier receivers being right there. Uh, being normally you see the smaller receivers being able to do that. But he's not – don't get me wrong, he's not a huge guy. But he's – normally you see the smaller, shiftier guys like your Deshaun Jacksons, your, you know, those guys. But this dude has – He looks like a faster Dwayne Bow. This dude has the speed, the wheels, and the hands are there too, um, yeah. as you as was displayed in this, in this uh, clip right here. Yeah. Right there. Just – and, and – and one of the things I noticed I loved about that clip and the reason I chose it was because that's a play that Patrick Mahomes would absolutely run. That's a play, yes. the rollout to the right, that's a play that absolutely would get run. So um, yes. let's move on to our number three pick. We'll, we'll get – now, for y'all that don't know, we will get to a seven-round mock eventually, but as of now, we we're, 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 we're building up to it. Let's go. 
Yes, yes. And last but not least, um, the third round running back tradition on this mock also lives on here again for another episode. Last episode, I selected Michigan's Blake Corum. Blake this Corum, time, yes. Yeah, man, I love Blake Corum, man. I, Chiefs, please, man, I hope you guys are watching that tape. But if you guys are not, this time it's Oregon's Bucky Irving with the 95th overall pick. Irving is a great pick at this spot for the Chiefs. With the potential loss of Jarek McKinnon and Claude Edwards Alaire, the Chiefs need to add to the backfield so Irving could sooner rather than later figure consistently in the Chiefs passing game. Irving is a versatile threat who carries the ability to make defenders miss into the run and passing games. Speaking of the passing game, Irving is dynamic in the flats and on screens. Despite having a 4.55 40 speed he has the vision the patience and the short area quickness to run through those holes just like alvin kamara that's my comparison of him and one of my other favorite running backs in this draft class besides quorum is usc running back marshawn lloyd who is another option to consider at this spot if it's not irving or quorum because they are known for also missing a lot of tackles but irving gets also that night because he's top three in missed tackles forced per attempt which is point 38 with nearly 20 200 carries according to pro football focus and irving is so compact and strong on contact that he can bounce off tackles with good contact but he also has the fast footwork with that short area quickness to put his foot in the ground and to make a hard cut to put defenders on a highlight reel. And he would be lethal in the Chiefs offense out of the shotgun. He would be very similar to Jared McKinnon and also Alvin Kamar in terms of his style and play speed. You're killing me with the third round running back, man. You're killing me with the third round running back. Uh, I mentioned it last week with Blake Corum. Um, I do like Blake. I, don't get me wrong. I do like Blake, but the yeah. idea of drafting the third round corner, I mean, court uh, running back is interesting to me. And the only reason I say it's interesting is because you were able to find uh, your current running back in the sixth or seventh round. And, yeah. And that seems a little rich for my blood for a running back. However, however, with that being said, I'm not the expert on these things. Like if, if, if there is dynamics to be had, there's dynamics to be had and you can have it at third round. Uh, because the, and, and we got to understand for me, when I look at third round, um, in picks, they are probably maybe a half a year away to a year away from, from giving you legit production, some of them, depending upon the draft, you know. So, uh, but these are two guys that could give you production almost right away at, uh, between Corum and, and Irving. Um, those are guys that could give you production right away, especially with our offensive line. Hopefully, uh, we'll probably eventually draft one uh, an offensive lineman, but looking at also his catching ability, which intrigues me a lot. Uh, so he finds space. He's a, he's strong enough to, um, as you saw, you saw the, uh, stiff arm here and the, and yeah, the agility ooh, moves like right there, just being able to get that first down. Yeah, yeah. Being able to get that first down. And on this play, you see where he used that forearm. I mean, that stiff arm to get into the end zone right there. Yeah. Get off me, mm. and then twice. So I definitely like never that. went down. Yeah. Never went down. I definitely like his, his low center of gravity, all of that. So uh, Bucky Irvin running back from Oregon with the ninety fifth pick. That is what's up. Uh, with that being said, I'm interested to see where the Chiefs decide they want to go this year. And again, Absolutely. we will have a we will have a seven round mock, and we're of course going to use the Chiefs picks. Uh, and I know Brett Brett Veach is going to wheel and deal and move up and down and move up and down. That's just what he does. But um, to recap, to recap, today we discussed the signings and re-signings, and then we mm-hmm. we dealt with the Chiefs wide receiver alignment prototype and who could be that route runner that we needed. That contested catch king. 
Yeah. And so, and then of course we had our mock draft and we always, always have a mock draft. So always. with that being said, I, we, we want to thank everybody for uh, watching and listening to the show. We appreciate all the likes. We please like and subscribe to Chiefs Focus. And by the by, uh, this show is going to be found under the Chiefs Focus umbrella of, of podcast shows. So if you're looking for us on the podcast, go look for Chiefs Focus, and then you'll see this show under the Chiefs Focus uh, brand. And just look for War Room with PMAC uh, in the episodes, and you will find it there. Uh, thank you, thank you all for listening, PMAC. What you have for us uh, to close us out? Like, like my man did said right here. Uh, like and subscribe if you guys are watching on YouTube. Uh, follow us on uh, Twitter X. Also, look us up on Facebook, and uh, yes, look us up on Apple Pod, uh, Podcasts and uh, Podbean. And with that, uh, I look forward to seeing you guys in the next episode of The War Room with PMAC. And once again, thank you guys for joining us this morning. And uh, peace, peace, deuces. Deuces.